Hello everybody, sorry for the slight delay in starting, we just needed to make sure that we let all the audience into today's session. Welcome to the ISO2400.org webinar, where we're going to be discussing sustainable procurement with a, a great group of speakers from around the world who will be introducing themselves in a moment. I'm Sean McCarthy, I'm a Director of Action Sustainability, and as part of our not-for-profit initiative, we sponsor and deliver this programme of work, which includes an interactive, very inter international website on sustainable procurement and specifically the ISO 2400 standard. We deliver webinars like this roughly once a month. We have a self-assessment tool on the website so you can assess yourself very broadly around how closely aligned your organization is to the standard. And it's very much a knowledge sharing platform so you can upload and, and share your knowledge on the system, which is available in various different languages. We have a very multilingual set of resources for you to learn from. So today is all about sustainable procurement. We're coming close to the fourth anniversary of the publication of the standard and indeed the launch of our program to try and build the body of knowledge around the world in sustainable procurement. I'm really pleased to say that we have people from 22 different countries registered to, to attend today's event. We've got people from various countries around the world to talk about the subject of sustainable procurement. So without further ado, I'm going to make a start and I'm going to introduce, first of all, Aaron Reid from Balfour BC in the UK. Aaron, you were claimed to be the first organisation in the world to have an independent evaluation against the standard. And I know you've been re-evaluated since then. Uh, so would you like to talk to us about your journey in sustainable procurement, what you've found, what you've learned from working in, in alignment with the standard? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sean. My name is Aaron Reed. I'm Head of Sustainable Procurement and Sustainability at, at Balfour Beatty in the UK. We're the UK's largest construction infrastructure main contractor. Thank you for mentioning we were the first in the world to be assessed, Sean. Sean knows I'm very embarrassed about that and I don't like to talk about it. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased that he mentioned that and, and I didn't have to. Um, I, I probably also need to start with something of an apology because I'm conscious that if any of you saw the link that was promoting the events, the, the picture that they used of me, I had hair in, in that picture. And so if I've been misrepresented in any way, I apologise. But I'm afraid it's one of the consequences of the, the lockdown we've, we've had in the UK and lack of access to hairdressers and that sort of thing. And I made the mistake of letting my 10 year old daughter cut my hair and there was only one way out of that situation and that was for it all to come off. So uh, yeah, I, I do apologise if any of you are disappointed with not quite seeing the person that you saw on the promotional image, but in, in any event, it's definitely me, I can reassure you. I, I really wanted to talk to you about our journey that we've had on sustainable procurement, a bit about kind of why and how and, and context and also why and how we ended up kind of going down the route of, of ISO 2400. Back end of last year, Balfour BT launched our brand new shiny sustainability strategy, Building New Futures. I would encourage you to you know, go to our website, go and have a look and see the types of things we're committed to. But essentially, we have made some really ambitious commitments around some of the areas that are most material to our business. So around environment and carbon in particular, we're committing to go beyond net zero by um, 2040. Um, around material use. Construction industry uses a lot of stuff. In the UK, it's something like 33% of all material uses in construction sector, or 66% of all material use, and 33% of all waste arising comes from the construction sector. So a real opportunity for, for us to have an impact on in our business. And we've made a commitment to get to zero waste generated by 2040. And we've also made commitments around people and community. So looking to achieve three billion pounds worth of social value generated by 2030 and to have a positive impact on over a million people's lives by 2040 and certainly the way that we engage with communities and, and the opportunity we have to employ people in those communities we feel again that's something that's really important for us to do a driver for all of that i suppose is you know obviously we're, we're a responsible business we want to do the right thing we want to manage our risks and opportunities but we're also being driven by our uh, our customers and we bid for work typically and what we've seen from our customers is a real shift in focus around sustainability and social value in particular, and this legislative or a government driver behind that as well. We've had things like the Social Value Act, things like public contract regulations, and a recent public procurement notification, which requires all 
central government procurement now to have a minimum of 10% weighting for um, social value and sustainability. But actually for the last couple of years, we've seen client organizations move to between 10 and 30% of the overall marks going over to social value and sustainability. And so where all other things are equal, and typically we win or lose work, you know, five, six, 7%. So suddenly to have 10 to 30% of available marks being available for social value and sustainability, it is the differentiator and the thing which people in our sector are definitely now competing on. There's a lot of collaboration and collaboration is key, but we certainly recognize now the, the opportunity we have to differentiate with our customers through the sustainability agenda. That said, most of what we do, 80% or thereabouts of what we do is actually delivered by our supply chain. So not by us. So most of the activity on our sites are our subcontractors. Most of the people you see wandering around our construction projects are employed by our subcontractors and our supply chain. And so most of the risk and most of the opportunity around sustainability also sits within our supply chain. So for all those grand ambitions and commitments that we've made around sustainability, actually, unless we can engage with the right supply chain, unless we can bring that supply chain with us on a journey and improve their capability, then we're never going to achieve those sustainability targets. And so we kind of clicked on to sustainable procurement and managing sustainability in our supply chain has been absolutely key to our sustainability ambitions uh, eight, nine, ten years ago. And I think we really recognise the power of procurement in delivering those sustainability ambitions. My background is around social sustainability. And I remember I used to go around asking people nicely if they wouldn't mind, you know, their organisation adopting more sustainable practices. And some of them were open to that. And some of them told me very nicely, they'll think about it, I think was the universal phrase. What I then found was actually we moved away from kind of asking people nicely and started talking to their customers and getting their customers to embed a requirement for change rather than for me to ask them nicely. And so I certainly recognize that the power of procurement in influencing change is probably the biggest driver you can have. And certainly within our own organization, um, it's kind of bad news for the sustainability professionals, but actually the procurement professionals in our business have more opportunity to influence sustainability outcomes than our sustainability colleagues do. And so, you know, very much, I think, you know, in any organization, but certainly ones where the majority of what you do is delivered through your supply chain, if you're only focused on that 20% um, kind of risk and opportunity area, you're really fooling yourself about the scope that you have and the responsibility that you have to address those risks and, and take advantage of, of those opportunities. And so that's why at Balfour BT, we embedded as a core competency for our procurement, sustainability as a core competency for our procurement people a couple of years ago now, because they really are key in ensuring that we deliver those sustainability outcomes. And that certainly was consistent with some of the feedback and some of the, that we got through going through the ISO um, 2400 process. But alongside that core competency and that piece of work to kind of win hearts and minds, we've also embedded sustainability considerations into our procurement process. And so regardless of you know, what their politics or what their beliefs are or quite whether or not we've won their hearts and minds or, or where they are on the competency journey, they have to go through a process which forces them to consider sustainability. We've literally embedded it into our e-procurement system. And that's all kind of based on a category specific risk and opportunity assessment, which now also allows us to assess our supply chain based on the risks that are relevant and proportionate to the things that we are buying and the value that we are buying to. Whereas in the past, we just have a huge 89 page document with health, safety, environment, sustainability and quality with conditions in there and say, you know, do you agree to comply with all of these requirements? And of course they tick yes, but actually we'd never really understand if they had the capability to deliver against those, or we re didn't really create the conditions for our supply chain to compete on delivering sustainability outcomes and have that incentive to improve their own capability. The issue, I suppose, and this is where we kind of came up to uh, discovering ISO 2400, was we had this approach to sustainable procurement because of the background and the context that I've just described. But actually what we didn't know, and we did it for very organic and natural reasons and what felt right for us, 
but we re didn't really have a sense of where the holes were in, in our approach. And so that's why when ISO 2400 came about in terms of being this internationally recognized standard of what best practice or consensus around what best practice looked like, it gave us a great opportunity to, to kind of say, okay, well, where have we got to and, and what do we need to do next? And certainly one of the most valuable things that we got out of it was the action plan on the back end, because it gave us a very clear, first of all, understanding of, of where we were, but a very clear roadmap of the steps that we needed to take next in order to improve, which actually was helpful in getting a mandate from within the business to actually move forward with those things. Because what we moved from was a situation where before ISO 2400, we had to justify and have a business case for every single little thing that we were trying to do because not everybody truly understood. But actually when people had this ISO 2400 thing that they could hang their hat around, suddenly the question was just, is this thing that you're asking me to do going to support us in terms of ISO 2400, yes or no? If it's yes, on you go, get on with it. If it's no, then please explain, put a business case together, etc. And so it really helped kind of all the, all the wheels of progress in, inside of our organisation as well. We're on to our second assessment against the standard now. And so we've been able to track and demonstrate internal to the business and to our external stakeholders, the progress that we've made since we did that first assessment some four years ago. The final thought I wanted to leave you with though is, is the one around, I mentioned that we were assessed against the standard and I was very careful with my language there because there are some other rogue organizations out there that claim they've been certified against the ISO 2400 standard. And actually you can't be certified against the ISO 2400 standard because it's a guided standard. And when I first looked at the guidance standard, I, I remember having conversations with Sean and, and his colleagues and, and I was appalled because, you know, this, this, this wasn't a proper standard. And, you know, where, where's my certificate? How am I going to prove to my stakeholders how fantastic I am? Because surely that was the point of doing, doing a certification standard. But actually, where we were at the time, a certificate is not what we needed. What we needed was an honest assessment of where we were on our journey and what steps we needed to take going forward. And I know for some organizations, certainly not for Balfour Beatty, but for some organizations, there can be a tendency with a pass or fail certification standard to push forward all the things that you're great at and all the good practice and move the auditor away from all your dark corners where all the secrets are kept. And actually, because there wasn't the pressure around pass or failing this standard, we just wanted to know where we were. We actively pointed the assessor towards all those dark corners because that's where we needed the most help. And so what we got was a much better outcome in terms of the report and the actions and the recommendations because they were honest and they addressed our most difficult problems. It also freed our people up to have honest conversations as well because nobody was concerned they were going to lose their job if they said the wrong thing or, or suddenly pointed them to one of our, our dirty secrets because, again, we actively wanted to shine a light on those dark corners. And so it freed our people up to have more honest and open conversations than they might otherwise have if they're employed by different organizations, notice my caveat, which again gave us a much better outcome. And so I just wanted to leave you on that thought because I know this is often some confusion or blurring or, or, or some diminishment of the quality of this standard being a guidance standard. Whereas for us, as I say, what we wanted was to genuinely improve our approach. If what you're looking for is a certificate on the wall to be able to prove how fantastic you are, this probably isn't the thing for you but if you genuinely want to understand where you are and and you want to to take those steps to improve then i would wholeheartedly recommend this standard to you and we absolutely do in terms of our supply chain and the stakeholders that we work with and we've actively encouraged other customers and, and peer organizations to go go down this road and we'll you know happily share our experience with anybody who's interested to listen so um, I, I hope that was useful or interesting if not deeply embarrassing in terms of my declaration of hair loss, but I'll hand back over to Sean and to my colleagues from around the world. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Aaron. It's really good to hear from somebody who's been genuinely working with the standard and working towards alignment with the standard for the past four years to get your kind of practical perspective on the issue. I've made a note of a couple of questions, but I'll move on rapidly and save the questions for the end. And obviously, those of you in the audience, please do feel free to type questions or, or comments into the chat as we go and then we'll pick them up at the end. So I'd like to move across to France now to Annie. Would you like to introduce yourself and talk to us about uh, what's happening from a French perspective? Yes, thank you, Fran. So I founded a consulting and training agency 
uh, ASEA, we specialized in sustainable procurement 13 years ago. And I'm also vice president of the French Sintan called Observatory of Sustainable Procurement in French OBSAR. This think tank was very involved to the, in the committee we implemented 2400 standard. So what do we do in France with the, with the standard? First, I want to tell you a little bit of history. In 2010, just after the financial crisis of 2008, in France, we created a, a charter for responsible suppliers relations with 10 commitments. It was created by the French government because they realized that trust and confidence in business relationships would bring a better global and economic performance. And then two years later, the government decided to take the next step, a label, which means checking if the commitments taken by the organization are implemented. It was called the label on responsible supplier relations. And in 2017, when we enrich this label with the expectation of the standard, of the ISO 2400 standard. And now it's called Label on Sustainable Procurement and Responsible Supplier Relationships. With this reference frame, the only one in France, a third party assessor like my agency can assess the maturity level to sustainable procurement in accordance with the standard. We have four levels, non-tangible, it's better not to communicate on it, incomplete, mature, or advanced. And we make an evaluation report, including the evaluation synthesis, and results is draft after one or two days on the site and after interviewing suppliers. So I can tell that 50 organizations now have been already assessed in France on the standard, including, for instance, government agencies like uh, French Ministry of Defense, very large companies like Michelin, Orange, French railway company called SNCF, airports of Paris and Lyon, energy companies, a lot of, of big companies, large banks, insurance companies, and many others like intermediate company, public or private. And since the, the COVID crisis, I can observe a lot of demand for assessment to the standard because the standard is really seen as a progress process. And I completely agree with what Aaron said, it's, it's the companies like to go into the dark corners to see what can be improved on each subject. And it's also a good opportunity for them to benchmark on the same reference frame. So that's one a big progress with the standard result, but we were helped also in the context by two French laws I want to describe now to you. I'm sure you remember in 2013, the collapse of the Rana Plaza buildings in Bangladesh who took lives of more than 1,100 garment workers. That's one of the reasons why I was particularly involved in the standard ISO 24000 to improve together sustainability internationally for the benefit of all enterprises. At least this tragedy opened the eyes of consumers and brought a due diligence guidance for responsible supply chain in the garment sector. And that was the origin of a duty of diligence law in 2017 in France. And this law draws on the model of the UK Modern Slavery Act and requires a vigilance plan. And there is actually a European reflection on the creation of a transnational article which should contribute to the process. Then another law in 2017 requires large French companies to put in place measures to prevent and detect corruption both in France and abroad. And it needs a corruption risk management plan. So by these laws, the French regulator paves the way for collective environmental, social and governments ESG risk management. As you may know, managing ESG risk in the procurement process and in the supply chain is central in the standard. So companies are encouraged or forced by law to manage the ESG risks. And also the professional investors, they are becoming increasingly involved in the supply chain as a result of these controversies that have arisen from these chains, like the collapse of the Rana Plaza building, for example, or we could say about the Uyghurs now, especially on human issues. And sustainable procurement so is completely related to assets management issues, which is a good thing. And we can see also 
a cultural change in the society. And this cultural change leads the company to minimize the risk of negative social impacts, human rights, labor practice, community involvement and development. And they give themselves the mission, we call them entreprise à mission in French, to have the most positive environmental, social, and economic impacts due to their activities. And as you know, it's also the definition of sustainable procurement. And last thing I wanted to share with you, think tank OPSA I talked about, I talked about just in the beginning. We, we measure every year since 12 years, how sustainable procurement is growing with, a bar, with this barometer. And this year, we saw that the interest in sustainable procurement is growing considerably, and especially it's good because it's, it's also a concern among SMEs. And the importance of drivers on sustainable procurement is fight against corruption, probably due to the law, social issues, I told you already, human rights, working conditions, diversity, and protection of environment. We also ask, do you know the standard? Yes, and it's, it's known by a large majority of companies, so it means we do a good work promoting the standard. And how do they use it? They use it as a guidance standard, which is exactly what we meant to do in the committee. And they use it also, which is much better, to follow recommendations and to prepare this label or this assessment. And we can observe that after four years of this standard, objective to respect the commitments have created a big community of organizations who are involved in continuous improvement plans, and it's a real virtuous dynamics. And to help more companies to get involved in it, we are preparing a book on ISO 20. 2400 standard, which will be called 100 questions to understand the standard. It will be written by a group of experts and companies. We belong to our symptom. So I'm very optimistic. I've seen really a lot of change for the past few years. When I started in 2008, I was an activist preaching in the desert, not anymore. And really the, the topic of sustainable procurement is going very full speed and I feel really optimistic for the future. And also I'm happy to contribute to demonstrate that procurement professionals, they can create values with values. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer the question later. Okay, thank you very much, Annie. It's really good to hear the amount of progress that's happening in France and, and that mixture of drivers between legislation and companies actually deciding to do this for themselves because it's a good thing. Yes, like you, I was involved in the UK Sustainable Procurement Task Force in 2005 and it was a very different world then. You know, the, there is a demand now, the, there's a pull. And I like your mention of the most positive social and environmental impacts and I, I know some of the speakers and many of the audience were involved in, in the ISO 2400 committee and we had a big debate about moving away from like preventing harm and, and dealing with risk and negative impacts to say no actually you can use sustainable procurement to do things better rather than do things less bad and that was a, a real debate among the committee members so it's very refreshing to, to hear that. What I would say I mentioned earlier the self-assessment tool that we have on the website it's not a full assessment against the standard it's simply 20 questions that you can ask yourself to get some idea of how aligned you are to the standard that self-assessment tool is is available in several languages and thanks very much to everybody who's been involved in translating it including my next guest Ava from Czech Republic Ava would you like to introduce yourself I know there's lots of exciting things happening in public procurement in your world including legislation a new academy would you like to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in your part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And thanks for having me. My name is Eva Hvalkovska, and I'll speak about sustainable public procurement in the Czech Republic. So not the private view, but the public procurement uh, view. I work for the Ministry of Lab Labor and Social Affairs of the Czech Republic in a public procurement department, actually on the special project that is promoting sustainable or as we call responsible public procurement and the, the project is called responsible approach to public procurement slash strategic public procurement so everything our audience for sure knows and uh, this project is financed from the european social fund 
and we work with ministries, state agencies, state companies, also municipalities and regions. And our clients are mostly public procurement specialists or tender administrators. So this is just the background information who our clients are. Uh, and our project serves as a competency center for public authorities. And we provide methodologies, checklists, publications focused on uh, sustainable public procurement, best practice examples. Mostly we try to collect them in the Czech Republic, but, but we also use British ex examples from other parts of the world. As Sean mentioned, we last year we established Educational Institute for Responsible Public Procurement that offers many webinars now or online trainings. And in the future, we hope also physical seminars. Also, we have established Association for Public Procurers, which is called Platform for Responsible Public Procurement. And this is a platform for networking and again, sharing best practice among various authorities. I would like to mention how we work with the ISO standard. Now, I would say that our methodologies were inspired by the, by the standard. You can find inspiration, for example, in our methodology for implementation of uh, sustainable public procurement in an organization or in a public organization. We based this on those five key principles and core subjects or priorities that we also identified or that are relevant in the Czech Republic. Other inspiration is also perceiving sustainable procurement as on one side risk mitigation and on the other side uh, taking advantage of using the opportunities to, to get higher value for the public, public finance that are spent in public procurement. We promote the standard uh, also in the Czech Republic, but I wouldn't say it's widely used yet. We translated the ISO to Czech language and we have actually official contract for distributing this unofficial translation. And we believe that this helps to Czech audience to get acquainted with the standard. We have also organized several trainings with Sean and his team, Action Sustainability. And so this helps us to promote the concept of responsible public procurement uh, in the Czech Republic. Now, I would like to share a few facts about sustainable public procurement in our country. Until the end of 2020, the responsible public procurement was, I would say, a voluntary. Main drivers for sustainable public procurement were personal leadership mostly, in some cases public policy, and in some environmental issues it was cost to save money when we choose more, for example, energy efficient solutions. Then the drivers actually change quickly because uh, a bill introducing mandatory responsible public procurement passed the parliament last December and quickly from January all the public procurers are obliged and now I will quote the law when uh, preparing tender specifications, evaluating bids and selecting suppliers to comply with the principles of socially and environmentally responsible procurement and innovations if allowed by the nature and purpose of a public contract. And the contracting authority is obliged to duly justify its procedure. So this naturally increased or fostered interest in responsible public procurement. And besides public authorities who were already experienced in responsible public procurement, there are still many of those who have not heard of it or they are very inexperienced in sustainable procurement. So we continue in our effort and we offer trainings, webinars, and also to help them to deal with this new duty. We developed a checklist for evaluating possibilities of responsible public procurement in each tender. And I would say I can compare it to the heat map that is included in the standard. It's a list of risks and opportunities that the procurement specialist should consider when preparing the specific tender. I can name a few items from the checklist and it 
it will sound familiar to everybody because it's employment of disadvantaged people, apprenticeships, decent working conditions, ethical trading, fair conditions in supply chain, including fair payments, support of SMEs, and of course, environmental or circular solutions. We translated this checklist to English, so then I can share in the chat the link so you can see what we are talking about. And finally, I would like to mention a few observations of sustainable public procurement development in Czech Republic during last years. The strong focus on the lowest price tenders is very slowly moving to other criteria evaluations too, but uh, still the lowest price remains the main and only criterion in the most of the tenders. So I, I would say this is big difference compared to British practice. And also communication with suppliers. In the past, it was very rare to, for the purpose or for the reason to avoid suspicion from some corruption practices. But during last years, the communication between procurers and potential suppliers has been boosted. And now we can see more events, uh, meet the buyer or the preliminary market consultations related to individual tenders happening. Procurers are introducing the plans of their uh, tenders, for example, for upcoming year. And always they include also introduction of uh, sustainable procurement requirements, which they will ask in the future. Or they consult it with the market if those requirements are suitable for the tender. In the end, uh, I've prepared a few challenges to mention because... Um, on our agenda of our team currently we have measuring so we work on a measuring tool measure i wouldn't say out impact yet but hopefully outcomes of the public procurement the sustainable public procurement so this is something where we also inspired in the british tom's tools and we hope this this will move to the practice of public procurement organizations in our country soon other challenge, uh, and maybe this will be common for many other countries, is lack of leadership support for sustainable public procurement or political support on the higher level, of, for example, of regions or cities. Still, it remains on the level of our initiative of tender specialists. But as I said, the law changed a lot, so maybe it will be also helpful to, to point attention of political leaders to, to sustainable procurement. And as uh, the third, the last challenge I would like to mention I see is stakeholders and engagement, which is also outlined in the ISO standard. So this is something that we definitely uh, should be better, better in. So this was the last point I wanted to mention and I look forward to the discussion with others or with the audience. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ava. It's been interesting to hear perspectives from the three different countries, you know, kind of going in similar directions. We're seeing government policy, we're seeing some legislation being introduced, we're seeing common challenges around upskilling supply chains, common challenges around measuring. Ava's mentioned stakeholder engagement. And, you know, for me personally, this is great because those of you that were involved in the committee developing the standard over, I think it was a four-year period, we were talking about all of these things and, you know, and how these challenges that might be dealt with by various different people around the world. And it's really great to hear some of those things come into life. And, you know, clearly we're not at the end of the journey yet, but it's interesting to see the progress that's being made in various different countries in the world. So I'd finally like to move over to Josh now from the United States. And first of all, thank you very much, Josh, for getting up so early in the morning in your part of the world. Josh was a, a very prominent and vocal member of, of the committee developing the standard. You've got a new president, Josh, so lots of exciting yeah. things happening. Would you like to give us a, a perspective from the United States? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Yeah, and thank you very much for having me here today. And again, it's wonderful to, to listen to Ava and Annie and Aaron and on their journey and, and understand where their countries are going. And saving the U.S. for last, that is a good idea most years. But as you said, we can now talk about climate change again, and that's a plus. But no, in all seriousness, our journey in sustainable procurement, believe it or not, starts a long, long time ago. George 
Herbert Walker Bush, our first George Bush president, actually was our first president to issue an executive order demanding that our federal government use the money spent to purchase more sustainable products. So most people think, you know, the U.S. is somewhat behind, but we've been doing it for many, many years. And it really starts, as most have talked about here, at a governmental level, what we call here in the U.S. through codes called authorities having jurisdictions or AHJs. Jays. And what happens there is, you know, the folks with the largest bag of money, which in the United States is typically the U.S. government, they get to print money, so they have the largest bag. They start to talk about sustainable procurement and how they're going to implement it. And, and with them, it started with energy savings and recycled content of products, right? Like simply recycled content paper. And they started to implement things such as the Energy Star label, which is one of the most utilized on the planet for reduction of energy usage in products, right? Because that started because the federal government wanted to stop using a lot of energy because it costs taxpayer money. All of us tree huggers on the line right now, and I include myself on that list, would love to think that everyone comes at this from the environmental perspective. But if we're honest, a lot of it comes from the financial side, and that's a good thing. So as it starts at that governmental level, it's the federal government of the U.S. that has pushed sustainable procurement throughout presidencies, never mind which president has been elected or reelected or, or come into office. And then obviously there are individual laws and, and legislation pushed through for different types of procurement. Our buildings are required to be LEED certified, for example, that leads to more sustainable procurement. Aaron is certainly familiar with sustainable building practices, and, and that leads to that sustainable procurement through the supply chain. That then filters to our state governments, another level of authority having jurisdictions, our municipal governments, another layer of authorities having jurisdictions. And then the last layer that a lot of people don't think of as authorities having jurisdictions, but when you truly think of it in total, they are, are these major organizations, whether it be universities like Harvard University and Stanford University have had sustainable procurement on their mind for decades, right? Almost as soon as the government, if not before, they were focused on sustainable procurement. Major organizations such as Walmart, uh, such as Microsoft, such as Target, these organizations have started to put not only their sustainable procurement for their buildings and their office spaces, but pass through for their suppliers. As Aaron said, and this gets into a funny situation where everyone thinks, well, I'm taking care of mine. Well, you know, someone else has to take care of theirs. Most people's impacts are on their purchases side, right? So Again, it kind of came from a top-down level, like Ava's describing in the Czech Republic, which is wonderful, and you described in, in the UK, and Annie's described in France. So, you know, there are some people on the planet who don't believe in, quote-unquote, big government getting involved, but certainly on the sustainable procurement side here in the US, and it sounds like in many other areas, they're the, the match that has started the fire, right? And it pushes through. Even so far in the US, where our US military has gone sustainable procurement, right? And they actually equate it back to their, their main mission, which is to protect not only themselves, but the folks that they are protecting in terms of the countries they're in or, or our own country. Because if they have to transport in energy or water or transport out waste, they have to do what are called sorties. You know, military members must leave a base. Well, anytime a military member leaves a base, there's potential for concern, right? Or, or, or conflict of some ilk. So if they have to use less energy, produce less waste, use less water, then they don't have to do these sorties. So therefore they're saving lives. So our military is actually one of our largest, which you wouldn't think of, right? Most militaries are like, oh, they're there to defend and protect and that's their whole full-time job. But they really have bought into the sustainable procurement and sustainable concept. When it comes to ISO 20,400, I must say the U.S. is not a quote-unquote adopter, right, in that we don't have many people assessing to it. I think it's mainly due to our 
what some around the world would call our cowboy nature. Hey, we've got this, we've already done it, and we were doing it before 20,400. It doesn't mean that we haven't adopted concepts out of it, certainly. Life cycle costing, which is in there, is being found more and more in sustainable procurement concepts. The concept in chapter seven, which I've always loved, there's a great story that we could tell you someday over some drinks around the Singapore flyer, uh, which is figure five in the document, which is chapter seven, it talks about the planning and integrating sustainable requirements and specifications, selecting the supplier, managing the contract, and then reviewing and learning from the contract, which by the way, one of the things I'm most proud of is we brought procurement experts into the development of the process. They were there from the beginning because they'll tell you, well, that's what they do every day. Why are you guys trying to reinvent the wheel here? This is what we do for every contract. You know, just because you're adding environmental or sustainability doesn't mean you need to change it. So again, that has been brought in and, and is certainly utilized a lot. The thing I am most proud of though, here in the United States is like everyone else, when I started these discussions with different programs, whether it be at the federal government level, local government levels, or the large organizational levels, it was sustainable procurement over here and procurement over here. It's not that way anymore. Sustainable procurement is procurement. And that's what I think I'm most proud of. And we all should be most proud of those of us that have worked here. It's just a seamless transition. And Ava, I know it feels like you're at the start of a very, very big hill, but I promise you, you'll get there where someday you won't be talking about sustainable procurement. You'll just be talking about procurement again and sustainability will be integrated within that. My final thing though is, this concept that, you know, we, we've always thought of the environmental world, you know, and frankly, to be honest, saving the planet for future generations and even ourselves, as we're seeing, has been the driver behind a lot of this. But as I mentioned before, the financial side cannot be forgotten. Our largest conversations that we're having nowadays around sustainable procurement are coming out of the financial sector, investor relations, organizations such as uh, SASB the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, are two of the largest drivers for sustainability in total and sustainable procurement. I say this because they are asking for transparency from all public companies. So when you've got something like $49 trillion looking at the SASB standards for transparency and understanding ESG impacts and asking questions of big box retailers, such as what percentage of your products that you sell to the public are third-party environmentally certified? That's a whole new ballgame. It's no longer tree huggers, <laughs> such as myself and Sean and Ava and Annie and Aaron as Aaron said, politely asking folks to get involved. This is people who can move their stock price. These are children coming up. And, and I say children, these are now 20 and 30 year olds who are in the investing world demanding change from where they send their money. These are massive billions to trillions of dollar endowments for universities being asked to divest from certain companies because of what they do sustainably. And sustainable procurement is a main part of that due to what Aaron talked about before, where 80 odd percent of your impact comes from your supply chain. So Sean, that's really where sustainable procurement is today. It started with those demands or, or procurement level things from the federal government to local governments, to those major organizations. And now it's being driven from a financial perspective and organizations demanding to understand, if I'm going to invest in you as a board in this public company, if you don't move forward, if you don't give me something to latch onto to say you're doing something, I'm gonna vote against you, frankly. Uh, Larry Fink is, writes a letter every year from BlackRock, the largest investment firm on the planet. They own like 3% of everybody. They probably own a good percentage of myself. But they send out a letter every year. And the last two years, Larry has been, uh, Larry Fink has been very clear. We will vote against you if you don't have a plan. And they have actually voted against me in board seats. So uh, that's kind of where we are today here in America is 
that financial discussion is now starting to drive a lot of sustainability discussion, including sustainable procurement and how it's, it's brought into the, the program. So looking forward to discussing all this with all of you folks. And again, Aaron, I think you look wonderful. I'm just somewhat shocked that people even tuned in after they saw my face on the, on the emails. So looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Josh. Isn't it lovely to see two middle-aged men discussing their appearance on camera? <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much for bringing up the investor issue and, and, you know, how large corporations are taking this. And, you know, the United States, you know, probably has the center of mass in the world of mega corporations in just about every sector. And the influence of them really, really can't be underestimated. I have lots of questions and discussions for everybody. But first of all, I'm going to kick off with a cracking question from Croatia. Thank you very much. It's a question specifically for Ava, but I certainly have a view. And I suspect Annie will as well. A question for Ava. Did you have problems to implement responsible public procurement in the Czech Republic due to the European Directive on Public Procurement? I'm asking because we've organised in Croatia promotion of ISO 2400 for representatives of public authorities, and they have claimed for them it is very difficult to apply the standard due to the requirements of the EU Directive. Ava, would you like to start yeah. to answer that one? <laughs> I, I'm sure a number of other people will have an opinion on that issue. Thank you. We are part of the EU <laughs> still, <laughs> and we adopted actually the European Directive on Public Procurement in 2016 in the Public Procurement Law. And even in this version of the law, it was possible to have requirements in uh, sustainability, let's say. It could be part of the specification, it could be part of evaluation criteria, you could use eco labels. So there are various ways how you can, in line with this public procurement law, to perform or ask for sustainability in public procurement. In uh, last year, Parliament amended the law to us. We were not lobbying for it, but they decided actually, I would say by themselves, to implement the new principle to the very beginning of the law, to the basic principles where transparency and non-discrimination is included. So the fourth principle now is the socially and environmentally responsible procurement. So this made it much easier to ask, or it was not easier, now it's duty to consider the responsible public um, requirement or responsible or sustainable requirements in each tender. So I would say it's definitely it's allowed by the European Directive. And when we see all the policies and the statements by the European Commission that they ask and promote sustainable public procurement very strongly, they promote all the best practice examples and so on. We have uh, often discussions about auditing or controlling mechanisms that if uh, some procurers are afraid to put their responsible or sustainable requirements in the tender because they are afraid of the audits they have to or they may undertake in the future. So that's also one of the reasons for using the lowest price criterion as only criterion. So I would say it's also one of the challenges to communicate with the auditing organizations or there are several Ministry of Finance uh, the highest uh, auditing office and the European uh, audit. So all those uh, should understand the sustainability and that it's possible and should be included in the public procurement too. Yeah, thank you, Ava. I mean, I, I would add to that from my perspective. I mean, I was part of the UK government sustainable procurement task force in 2005, <laughs> um, speaking obviously as a, a country now that is a former member of the EU. But we did look at this at the time, and, and this was before the EU legislation was very mature. And it was just an excuse by civil servants to do nothing. You know, it's, it's very good to bring in EU law as the reason not to do anything. And it was a nonsense. Of course, you can apply criteria that are relevant to the supply under EU law. And we, we had a wonderful example with who was the mayor of London at the time, Ken Livingstone. And they were building a big extension to the, the London Underground system in East London. And they put supplier workforce diversity criteria 
into the tender evaluation. And he actually had advice from his legal department to say, you know, you can't do this under EU law. The EU law won't allow it. And his response was, well, how can building public transport infrastructure in one of the most diverse communities in the world, how can diversity not be relevant to the supply? And he did it. And, you know, London didn't collapse. The, the sky did not fall in. Armies of lawyers did not appear on the doorstep. It was done. So I, I know it's very tricky in some countries, and I know it's very difficult. Um, people will put these barriers in the way, but please do persevere because it's a myth. The other thing, Avery, in your talk early, you did mention the issue of corruption. And I know, I mean, I, I've worked with your colleagues in the Czech Republic for about 10 years or so now. And um, I do remember when I, I first went over there, there was definitely a driver to absolutely do nothing but choose the cheapest. Because if you don't choose the cheapest, then there's potentially a, a suspicion of corruption. And there was a, a genuine fear in people's minds of some of those issues when I was first working in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And I think that's improved a lot, but we shouldn't underestimate some of these concerns that, that happen. But uh, no, I, I'm, please don't be put off by people who say the EU laws won't allow you to do it because it's simply not true. Annie, I know you work primarily in the, the private sector, but do you have a view from France on, uh, on <clears throat> the EU public procurement rules? Yes, I just want to say that I think the European directive is very helpful for the public procurement. First, public procurement, also, they were a bit in advance at the beginning on sustainable procurement because they made a social clauses. I mean, like to introduce, promote integration of people with disabilities or away from work, things like that. And then the, I think public procurement, they, especially with the European directive, and French people follow this uh, directive and, and adapt in the French public procurement. For instance, they, uh, they try to promote buying from SMEs. And so it's, it's a, a real, uh, we, we can adapt the law and tenders to help the SMEs to answer to the tenders. They also ask not to see only the cheapest price. I don't know how to say in, in English, with, I would say the best price, but in French we say le mieux disant. That means to consider not only the price, but all yeah. of the other costs. Yeah. It's best value in English, yeah. Best value, yeah. And also, I want to say an example with uh, what were well, inspiring for us during these four works together with the committee in Singapore and other places. And you will smile and I see George smiling. When we were talking about the, the method of life cycle costing, we were trying to say that the buyers have to see above total cost of, of ownership, TCO, everybody knows, but they have to figure out that they have to take account about externalities on their uh, buying. And one of the externalities, like environmental externalities, it was already in the European directive. I think it was the most advanced system and we, we took example on it. So I don't want to make another course about this today, but <laughs> just to say, last thing, uh, the only thing which is not so easy for, for public procurement is when we talk about local buying, because with the rule, it's completely forbidden to favorize local suppliers. And that's a big, big issue uh, with public procurement. And I see it's, that's a big difference with private procurement because now the, the, to buy local suppliers and to buy solidarity and since the, all the crisis we have had uh, uh, recently and which is not finished, we have seen we have been very so dependent on, on Asiatic source. So now it's a new concern and, and very important. Okay, thank you very much, Annie. I do hope that gives anybody that's concerned about the relationship between the EU laws and sustainable procurement some reassurance that it can be done. We've got another really good question for Aaron. So sometimes actions associated with sustainability or ESG are misaligned in the organisation, especially large organisations in the early stages of sustainable practices. In these cases, would it be the best strategy to implement and connect the actions of sustainable procurement to the daily operations? This, again, is something that we discussed a lot on the ISO committee and we talk about a lot in the UK and various other countries. What I describe as the golden thread 
between corporate policy and values or organizational policy and values in the public sector and what we do in procurement. So uh, I guess the question really, Aaron, is what do we do if that's missing? If there isn't really the alignment at the top, how do we best deal with it? Kind of taken by a comment from Josh earlier on about kind of the different drivers and certainly an approach that has worked for me in terms of sustainable procurement is focusing on the outcomes and you know i'm not concerned about what drives the delivery of the outcome or what motivates my stakeholders and actually what where i've had success is where i have a strategy of you know identify your stakeholders work out what's important to your stakeholders and then align sustainable procurement to the priorities of your stakeholders and so you know if my stakeholder is concerned about reducing cost then I'm concerned about reducing cost. And I'm gonna give you five new ways through sustainable procurement that you can reduce cost. And so I'm not giving you a burden, some additional thing to do that is sustainable when you're focused on cutting costs. I'm giving you a new way to deliver the thing that it is that is your priority. And oh, by the way, it's also gonna deliver a sustainability outcome. And so, you know, because we have so many things in our organization that people were doing that I would define as sustainable procurement, that they just called good business or good procurement or good delivery or, or whatever it was, but actually it delivered my outcomes. Personally, I'm unconcerned about that misalignment, if I've understood what you mean by misalignment, because I, someone once said, and it might have been Sean, that you can deliver so much more when you're unconcerned about who takes credit for it. And so, you know, there certainly are people in my, in my business and, and in others that, You know, they want it to be created and developed by them. But personally, I'm I'm focused on the outcome. And so if I've understood the question correctly, you know, I'm unconcerned about misalignment and where something sits as long as it delivers the outcome. And I can bounce off and play off of that activity to do even more things. So I'm I'm not sure if that's answered the question or if I've understood it properly. But, you know, I'd I'd welcome your comment, Alexandra, in in case I've misunderstood that. Okay, thank you, Aaron. I think it's interesting. I've certainly had experience working as a consultant with a number of large organisations over many years. And I'm working with one now that I, I shouldn't really name. But certainly where we've looked at a sustainable procurement approach and where there is demand for it. So the the client that I'm working with at the moment, there's clearly a demand from their customer base. There's a massive demand for investors. BlackRock, interestingly, are their biggest investor that Josh mentioned earlier. They're trying to take a sustainable procurement approach, but they don't have a particularly strong policy on sustainability as an organization and what we're starting to do there is to set out a fairly strong best practice agenda to challenge the organization to say actually you know you you should have something better at the, the high level in the organization and I did that 10 11 years ago with a United Utilities a water company in the UK where we started off with a sustainable procurement policy and strategy and as Aaron said made the case at a level of this makes business sense for us to do and then by the way you know wouldn't it be better if we had a stronger corporate policy around some of these things and uh, united utility certainly went from strength to strength after that and were dow jones sector leaders in the in sustainable procurement many years ago so i think these things can be done it is possible to, to make those connections aaron if i can just stay with you just fascinated by your talk at the beginning of the session what does beyond net zero mean to balfour Beatty? <laughs> Thanks for that. I'm, I'm, you can't use an expression like that and get away with it, Aaron, and not explain it. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure Josh has a comment which was going to be far more interesting than anything I've got to say. <laughs> My caveat is, you know, I'm very much a social sustainability person and I, I certainly am not a subject matter expert on carbon. Um, but I've got much more intelligent colleagues that do that. But my understanding of beyond net zero is about, you know, getting to zero is one thing, but actually we want to be in a positive position where we're going beyond in that sense, but also that it's not just about getting to zero. It's about, you know, and, and certainly, you know, the whole argument around offsetting, that's it's not trying to have a focus around offsetting. We're trying to have a focus around improving our practices. Again, for all the reasons that Josh mentioned, because, you know, ultimately getting to net zero carbon position and, and going beyond that, is a, a positive financial contributor to the business. It means reducing costs within the business. So b- beyond net zero is meant to be an all-encompassing statement, which talks about not only going 
um, beyond net zero in terms of the, the numbers and the absolute numbers, but also in terms of our, our broader practices around how we manage carbon in our business. So that, that's my understanding, but I, I may maybe quickly <laughs> correct our contacts no. who, are, who are dialing in as we speak to- uh, Aaron, to you did great. You did wonderful. <laughs> Now, Sean, so one thing that I can speak to, I've heard other people make the comment and Aaron, I haven't spoken with anyone in your organization. So have your comms people email me and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in sustainable building, right? We typically call it green building, right? Which means being more sustainable, but there is a movement now and there's a, a number of buildings built here in the US and I'm sure around the world that are called blue buildings. And that's because they're not only environmentally friendly and, and reducing energy and reducing water, they're actually supplying more than they use to the grids. And that is beyond, right? That, so that's not only am I taking back, I'm giving, right? I'm not taking, I'm, I'm giving. So Aaron, I'm, I'm hoping, and I believe that's probably where your smart carbon people started to talk about. I do have one question for Aaron, Sean, if I may, around that though. So when you make these commitments to net zero by 2040, zero waste by 2040, right? In these comments, one thing I wouldn't mind you telling people about though is the hardest part of making those commitments isn't writing it on a piece of paper sending out a press release and someone standing up and saying it that's easy and there's a lot of people making those today it's understanding the timeline and getting to that level right so can you talk about how you folks actually have to do the tracking to understand what your carbon is and what your waste is today that's the, that's the most important part to make those commitments because you can't make a commitment to, I'm going to reduce X when you don't know what X is. So I think that's a huge part in procurement. It is. And, and again, I'm definitely not the best qualified person to talk about this, but I've certainly seen the work that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, part of the commitments we've, we've made around carbon is we've also committed to setting a science-based target, which will support us on that journey. But certainly, you know, those numbers were not plucked from out of the air. They're kind of, you know, evidence-based based on where we are now. Certainly, we've done a lot of work around our scope one and two. Um, we've seen something like a 51% reduction in, in the last couple of years around our scope one and two. But again, is acknowledging actually, you know, 90% of our carbon emissions are in our supply chain. And so although that 51% is good, we recognize again, this is the sustainable procurement piece. Actually, we've got to have the impact in our supply chain. So yeah, I really can't speak to the, the detail of the work that sits behind that. But what I can tell you is there is a lot of detail. And certainly it was a, a year in the making, well, more than a year in the making in terms of setting those commitments. And so they've gone through rounds and rounds of kind of scrutiny to ensure that. And, you know, we're, we're audited by people like Price Waterhouse Cooper and others to ensure that, you know, the commitments we're making are evidence based and deliverable and certainly our progress along the way but if there is an image which I can see now and I'm wishing my, my colleague was here to kind of talk about it where we have set out you know what are those actions what are those interventions that we need to make along the way that are going to have the the biggest difference and the biggest impact you know we've got a big focus on our most material carbon impacts around c concrete for example we know yes 90% of our carbon emissions in our, in our supply chain but the majority of them are around the concrete and cement products that we use and so we've got a big focus on working with those providers we know we use a lot of energy on our sites and so we've adopted a new technology called Econet recently where we're you know actively reducing en uh, energy consumption on our sites we're adopting hybrid and all electric company car fleets increasingly using hybrid plant operations there's a, there's a range of different kind of interventions but the, the good news is I suppose from our perspective is you know once you know regardless of the data and the evidence that sits behind them once you make that commitment and the commitment to the science-based target we kind of bind the, the organization then into ensuring that we deliver on those things, those interventions, which will deliver on it. So I suppose, to, you know, to, to use the kind of government example, and I, I suppose Donald Trump's not, not the, the best example, but, you know, if we get a changing leadership, we've already made that commitment now to, to where we're going to go. And therefore that commitment has to be maintained to those actions and those interventions that will deliver those comes for us. So, yeah, I'm definitely not best placed to answer that, but hopefully that gave you some, some insight into that. What I'd had a comment, actually, just on something that Annie was talking about in terms of local procurement. And, and again, you know, I, I may have misunderstood this, but in the UK, there's something called the public contract regulate around local procurement is what my comments around. And in the UK, there's something called the public contract regulations. And there is something, a public procurement notification around the procurement of steel, which goes into even more kind of detail. And the effect of these things, it appears to me, is to enable local procurement 
using best value and carbon as a proxy to get there because they are weighting into the procurement decision the degree to which you can deliver social value or carbon reductions and clearly the more local the supply the bigger social value you can deliver and the greater carbon reduction you can claim potentially and so although yes eu procurement regulations which i suppose we're less concerned about now in in the uk but although that was the intention the public contract regulations here serve to me the effect is it would deliver an outcome which would favor more local supply and so whether or not that's a device which could be deployed in, in other countries to achieve a similar outcome should that be desirable um, it might be worth looking into the uk public contract regulations well i, I can answer to you yes that's what public procurement does but they are cheating a bit I mean, normally the regulation is, says you cannot ask for local suppliers. So they, when we were talking, when we were in the committee with uh, preparing the standard, we had the old, in our French committee, we had the public procurement people and they said, no, we cannot ask local suppliers because we are going to jail if we see uh, that the tender has been given to local suppliers. And it be, it's because it's a new regulation, you know. But what they do, in fact, they, they cheat a bit. Like they ask the distance... And of course, they would calculate the carbon to, uh, footprint and emission of, and or they could ask for disabilities people or for SMEs or, you know, and of course, we know this kind of, of companies are just local or something like that. But it's, they are trying to make, for instance, on, I'm going to say, you know, Moliere, of course, which is a French uh, writer. So we have a closed Moliere in some uh, working uh, build, building construction, you know, because when you have a lot of people coming from every different country in Europe. I mean, they don't speak French and it, it can cause a, a security problem, of course. But, and that's why I said, okay, it's a closed Moliere, they have to speak French. It's in a way for security, but it's always, it's also to, to protect French workers because we have lost some, some laws in, in Europe with, uh, I don't know the term in, uh, in English, it's called uh, travailleur détaché. For, for instance, they come from Czechoslovakia, sorry, but they don't pay the insurance in France. And so it's, it's like a dumping, social dumping, you know, for, for French workers. So there are many, we are trying to do many things with that, but public procurement is completely, uh, it, it's a problem anyway. They have to cheat a bit to cheat that. And like in US, they have a, they, they can say, okay, we want to buy local, things like that. They are not, they, are, they don't have the same constraints as, as we have. Okay, thank you very much, Annie. We're, we're getting a few questions in the chat, but we're rapidly out of time. So I think I'd like to, if I can, I'm just going to cover one more question. I am making a note of questions in the chat, and we, we have your email addresses for those of you who uh, apply to join the session. So we will come back with uh, answers to your questions in email if we don't get a chance to cover everything. So this is really a question from Marco Allsop, which is quite a general one. Where benefits from driving sustainability good practice are less immediately tangible than saving money, are there any recommendations for how to quantify and present those benefits to decision makers to bring into force? Thinking of the National Health Service, where cash is always short and the ultimate aim is getting people well again, so everything else is secondary without there being strong evidence proposals to support that it isn't necessarily available. Uh, I guess if I could just offer a view in, initially, and then I'll, I'll throw it open to the group. We do work as consultants with NHS procurement, for example, and there are a lot of sustainable procurement requirements coming down the track there. There is policy in the UK now, as Aaron mentioned, to include 10% for social value. Much more intuitively, surely delivering social value and creating better social conditions for underprivileged people in particular is going to make them less likely to be ill and need the services of the health service. So that there is a kind of a circular thinking in there. But if I can ask maybe Aaron, do you have a perspective on this, this whole sort of beyond price value type of issue? Yeah, two thoughts I've got, because I mean, we had this discussion um, with our own kind of putting the sustainability strategy together. And, you know, when we're making these ambitions for 2040, it wasn't lost on the senior leadership that they weren't likely to be in post in 2040 when the chickens came home to roost around, you know, delivering on those commitments. And so there's very definitely something that we had to do around building in 
short term. We've, so we have kind of these ambitions that we have for 2040, the targets that we have for 2030, and then we have milestones for 2025 and annual proof points that sit underneath that to ensure that there's that kind of visibility of A, how we'll get there in terms of a roadmap, but also that accountability along the way in the short term for existing stakeholders. But I think this, this is also getting into the whole realms of that CAPEX and OPEX kind of discussion that I kind of seem to have endlessly, particularly with some of our customers and, and the whole need to kind of bring forward life cycle costing more and more. And I appreciate I'm going back to the, the finance thing again. But often you see very perverse decisions being made around things which have an upfront cost saving, but are clearly going to cost more in the use of, of that asset or that equipment or whatever it is. And so for me, I think the, the art has always been in finding a way to demonstrate some element of benefit from that longer. So still having a, a recognition and acknowledgement of that longer term benefit that you will deliver, but finding a way to demonstrate the milestones and the proof points along the way that will also deliver a benefit. So yeah, it's a real tricky one. So great question. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Yeah, there are some well, some questions and answers coming through coming through on the chat, but I really am gonna have to wrap now. Uh, because we're coming up to time. Yeah, an hour and a half has, uh, has absolutely flown by. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for really giving us a, a clear articulation of what's happening in your countries. A, a whole bunch of issues have kind of come out of the discussion here that uh, we don't have time to tackle today, but we'll take that on board and we'll, we'll start to think about what future webinars might look like and how we might pick up on some of this subject matter specifically so thank you very much to our speakers thanks to our audience we will get back to you those of you that didn't get answers to your questions in the chat and enjoy the rest of your day thank you very much everybody <laughs>